This video is brought to you by the Historograph Poster Store. We've got two new posters for sale on the Battle of Jutland in 1916 and the surrender of the German High Seas Fleet two years later. Follow the link in the description to check them out. How many heavy gun turrets should a battleship have? This was a question that kept naval designers up at night for decades. At the start of the 20th century, the answer was generally two. Then, with the coming of the Dreadnoughts, ships had three, four, five, even in a few cases, six turrets. But only once in the history of battleship design did a ship appear with seven main turrets, creating a broadside of such explosive power that there were serious concerns that when all the guns fired at once, the ship would break itself in half. This is the remarkable story of the slightly absurd HMS Agincourt. The first remarkable thing about HMS Agincourt is that it didn't begin life called Agincourt, or even as a British ship. It was laid down in September 1911 as the Rio de Janeiro, the third and latest battleship for the Brazilian Navy, which was involved in an intense arms race with its neighbours in South America, Chile and Argentina. All three nations were desperate to have their own dreadnoughts, whose explosive power was matched only by their enormous cost and status as symbols of national pride. Lacking the ability to produce these huge weapons of war, they had turned to other nations to build them for them, Argentina to the US and both Chile and Brazil to the British. By 1911, all three nations had or were procuring two dreadnoughts, and so Brazil sought to raise the bar to obtain a third battleship with greater size and strength than any of its continental rivals. This was the Rio de Janeiro, and it would be the longest battleship at that point in history with the highest number of main guns ever fitted, 14 12-inch guns in seven turrets. Rio de Janeiro's construction began at Newcastle in September 1911, just a stone's throw away from where the same yard was building one of the Chilean battleships that the Brazilian ship was intended to counter. For two years the building ran smoothly, with Rio de Janeiro launched in January 1913. But as that year progressed, the financial position of Brazil's government was weakening, resulting in the ship being sold in December to the Ottoman Empire, which renamed it to Sultan Osman. The Ottomans were engaged in their own regional rivalry with Greece, and both nations were pouring money into naval procurement, £15 million between them by 1914, or roughly half of their combined national income. The Ottomans were determined to get their hands on the Sultan Osman whatever the financial cost. Additional taxes were levied, national collections held, and even an entire month of civil service salaries expropriated to help pay for the navy. By the summer of 1914, the Sultan Osman was nearing completion, but the Ottoman ship was about to crash headlong into geopolitics. The unravelling political crisis in Europe suddenly made the British Admiralty jumpy about handing it over to a hostile nation. At the end of July, just days before British entry into World War I, they seized both Sultan Osman and another Ottoman battleship then under construction in a British yard. The two ships were quickly taken over, converted for British use, and swiftly pressed into service as HMS Canada and HMS Agincourt. It was an act of hard-nosed self-interest against what was still at that point a neutral power, but it also had strong military logic. The Royal Navy's advantage over the German High Seas Fleet was on paper stretched from 24 to 26 dreadnoughts to the German 17. Seizing the ship was one thing though, actually bringing it into service as a useful member of the Grand Fleet was quite another. With its 14 12-inch guns in 7 turrets along with 20 secondary 6-inch guns, Agincourt was a misfit, out of step with the British battleships constructed at the same time, which favoured a smaller number of higher calibre guns in fewer turrets. In fact, so much of Agincourt's displacement had been devoted to the guns that very little had been left for the armour which meant Agincourt had one third less bell armor than a comparable British battleship, despite weighing 2,500 tons more and having smaller guns. Inside the ship, the crew's living quarters were far more luxurious than was standard, having been outfitted to Ottoman tastes, earning the ship the nickname the Gin Palace. But the luxury had come at the cost of some watertight compartments, and the ship's survivability in the case of torpedo attack was not promising. 
All this did not make Agincourt a massively appealing ship in the eyes of the Royal Navy's admirals, an impression that was not helped by a persistent rumour that if the ship fired all of its guns simultaneously it would break in half. Many of Agincourt's crew were also misfits since finding a crew of 1100 for a battleship at no notice was a challenge even for an organisation as large as the Royal Navy in 1914. To crew Agincourt, sailors were transferred from the Royal Yacht Victoria and Albert and at the other end of the spectrum from Naval Jail, where sentences for more minor offences were commuted so that they could go to sea. On August 26, 1914, this misfit ship, crewed by misfit sailors, arrived at Scarpa Flow to join the fleet. Nearly two years later, Agincourt got the chance to prove itself in battle when it joined the 6th Battle Squadron for the Battle of Jutland the titanic clash between British and German fleets in May 1916. The 6th Battle Squadron was an odd bunch of ships. Whereas the other British divisions were generally ships of the same class firing the same kind of gun, the 6th Division had Marlborough firing 13.5 inch guns, Revenge firing 15 inch and Hercules and Agincourt firing 12 inches. It was positioned on the extreme starboard wing of the Grand Fleet, which meant that when Jellicoe turned the fleet east to form one continuous line, Ashencourt was right at the back, close to where Beatty and his battle cruisers were approaching from. When she spotted German ships approaching from the south, the eccentric battleship opened fire in anger for the first time, with her seven turrets, now named after the date of the week, loosing thunderous broadsides towards the enemy. Agincourt was a sight to behold, with the flash from each broadside apparently big enough to create the impression that a battle cruiser had blown up. An officer on the light cruiser HMS Galatea, which was manoeuvring nearby, recounted a salvo which lifted us out of the water. I don't know how many of her 14 12 inch guns she fired, but I felt as if my head was blown off. Thankfully for its crew, the rumours about Agincourt's ability to withstand her own broadside were unfounded. One historian reports that the only thing that broke on board was the crockery in its well-appointed wardroom. For all its smoke and fury though, Agincourt's fire was not especially effective. It had a lot of guns, but the calibre was too small to be among the heavy hitters. The Royal Navy's modern Queen Elizabeth class had nearly half as many guns, but the weight of its broadside was much higher due to its 15-inch shells. There was a chance for Agincourt to do serious damage though, but it came hours after the main engagement. After 1am as the British fleet headed south in cruising formation, the 6th Division had contact with the crippled German battlecruiser Seidlitz, which was staggering its way towards Germany. Agincourt spotted the ship in the darkness, but did not open fire so as not to give their own position away. Just ahead of them, Marlborough's gunnery officer also spotted the maimed battlecruiser and asked for permission to fire, but the ship's captain declined, worried that it could be a British ship. The gunnery officer later said, of course, what I ought to have done was to have opened fire and blown the ship out of the water, and then said sorry. Like much of the Grand Fleet, Jutland was to be Agincourt's only combat operation of any note during its short career. Like the rest of the fleet, it was present for the surrender of the High Seas Fleet in 1918, but as soon as the war ended, its days were numbered. The Royal Navy simply had no use for a ship with such an absurd gun layout, and after Brazil declined to buy it back, she was sold for scrap in 1922. There will never be a perfect answer to the question how many gun turrets should a battleship have, but we at least have the story of Agincourt to help us remember what one of the wrong answers was. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more videos on bizarre ships and their designs, make sure to leave a comment and I'll see you in the next video. I'd also really appreciate it if you checked out our poster store. There are two new posters on sale, both about events that HMS Agincourt took part in. And if you become an Historograph patron, you can get 10% off any poster order.